Hi, my name is Brian Caffo, and this is the Hypothesis Testing Lecture in the Statistical Inference class in the Coursera Data Science Series. This class is co-taught with my collaborators, Jeff Leek and Roger Pang. We're all in the Department of Biostatistics at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. So hypothesis testing is concerned with making decisions using data. Um, so usually we have a null hypothesis that is sort of represents the status quo. We usually label that guy H naught. Um, this null hypothesis, in, in, the, in the way in which we're going to discuss hypothesis testing, the null hypothesis is assumed true and statistical evidence is required to reject it in favor of a research or alternative hypothesis. So let's just consider a, a quick example. So a respiratory disturbance index, which is a measure of sleep disorder breathing, more than say 30 events per hour, is uh, considered very severe. Um, so I, let's assume 30 is a, is a benchmark cutoff. Um, uh, I think diagnosing sleep disorder breathing, you, you look at events far less than 30 per hour. Um, suppose that in a, we were interested in testing whether a particular population um, you know, uh, has a kind of a high mean of RDI relative to even what is uh, uh, severely disordered. So imagine if we had a particular sample of overweight subjects with other risk factors for sleep disorder breathing at a sleep clinic, uh, then the mean and their mean R RDI was 32 events per hour uh, with a standard deviation of 10 events per hour. Um, the question is, is 32 large enough to reject the null hypothesis that the mean for that population is 30 in favor of the research hypothesis that this mean is at particular risk for high sleep disorder breathing in the form of having a population mean larger than 30 events per hour. Okay, so here, so we want to test between this hypothesis and this hypothesis. And here mu is the population RDI. So how can we do that accounting for uncertainty? Certainly 32 is bigger than 30, but that's not enough. So we'll go through the rules and how to do that. Um, so in, in this case, the, the hypotheses are usually of the form, uh, the alternative hypotheses are of the form, um, say, HA mu greater than mu naught, mu less than mu naught, and mu not equal to mu naught is another one. Um, and so, uh, it, we, you know, regardless of which alternative we have, there are four outcomes to our statistical decision process. So if H naught is true and we decide H naught, then we've correctly accepted the null. If HA is true and we decide H, um, HA, then we've collect, correctly rejected the null. And if H naught is true and we decide HA, then we've made an error. And that particular kind of error is called a type 1 error. Conversely, if HA is true and we've decided H naught, then we've made a, another kind of error, which we call a type 2 error. The way that we're going to work in our particular way is we're going to control uh, the probability of a type 1 error to be small. Okay, so that's going to be, we're going to make sure that happens. And that's going to have consequences, the fact that we've controlled the type 1 error, but not controlled the type 2 error. So, you know, to, to tie this back to a contextual example, so consider a court of law. The null hypothesis is that the defendant is innocent because in, in, in most courts they assume that the um, um, person on trial is innocent. And so we, re we require evidence to reject the null hypothesis, in other words, to convict the person. But we have, you know, we can balance the amount of evidence we require to, to, to convict. So if we require very little evidence, um, then what would happen is we would put a lot of innocent people um, in jail, which is type 1 errors, right? Um, um, but we would also increase the percentage of guilty people uh, convicted, that would be correctly rejecting the null. If we require a lot of evidence to convict people, then the percentage of innocent people let free, uh, that would be correctly accepting the null, um, would increase and we would, we would, um, um, you know, we would, we would 
make sure that we didn't convict a lot of innocent people. On the other hand, though, we would also increase the percentage of guilty people let free. So what we need to figure out is how to balance that evidence in a, in a way that we understand. Um, so consider our example again with the respiratory disturbance index. So a reasonable strategy would be to reject the null hypothesis if x bar was larger than some constant c, where we had, you know, c factored in the uncertainty in measurement of x, in the measurement of x. So one way to, to do this is choose c so that the probability of a type 1 error is 5% or some small value, right? The idea is, you know, 5% does happen to be a benchmark value, but the idea is we set alpha to be small. So here, we're going to just define alpha as the type 1 error rate, the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when, in fact, the null hypothesis is true. Okay, let's, figure, let's see if we can figure out a way to do that. So um, uh, 5%, we want 5% to be the probability that x bar is bigger than c. Um, we, know, we know that the distribution of x bar, right, under h0, it's going to be centered at, at um, under at h naught. It's going to be centered at 30, and the standard deviation is going to be sigma over square root n. Okay. So it seems like what we would want to do is choose our constant c so that the probability of being larger than it is 5%. Um, so given that we know that the sigma over square root n is 10 over square root 100, so that's just one we can kind of figure out what C has to be, right? Um, we could do it with just a, a, a Q norm, right, um, statement. So we could just do Q norm uh, 0.95, because we want 5% in there, and we want 95% in there. Q, and then uh, uh, mean equal 30, and standard deviation equal um, 1. Right, and that would give us the C constant that we need in terms of in, in terms of comparing X to it. Um, but often, um, uh, you know, kind of I guess mostly for historical reasons, um, what we do is we convert X into a standardized unit, a Z score, right? Because um, so we calculate how many standard errors from the hypothesized value x is, and under the null hypothesis, that guy follows a standard normal distribution. Okay, and so if we did that on that side, we have to do that on this side, and we get c minus 30 over 1, and so we get, we, and we know for the standard normal, you know, the point so that 5% lies above it, we know that it's 1.645. And in fact, for the non-standard normal, we knew that it was it was going to be, um, you know, mu plus 1.645 times sigma over square root n. So we could plug that in. Uh, we didn't we wouldn't have to use Q norm, but if you wanted something other than 5% or some value you didn't know, you would have to use Q norm. Um, so at any rate, we could solve this equation and get that C is 31.65. So anytime we get an X bar greater than 31.645 we will reject where remember where the, the the 31 incorporates the mu equal 30 from the null hypothesis and that sigma over square root n equals 1. Okay? Um, so in general we don't convert C back to this original scale. We, we just work with everything on the standardized scale. So we, we just reject um, so we could just reject because the z-score, which is how many standard errors the sample mean is, is above the hypothesized mean, if it's above a critical value. So our, our observed mean was 32, our hypothesized mean was 30, our standard error is 1 in this case, which works out to be 2. So we know that our observed mean was two standard errors above the hypothesized mean. So um, we would compare that to a standard normal di distribution and find out where our 2 was relative to the, to the quantile so that 5% lies above it. And in this case, 1.645 is that quantile. 2 lies above it, and so we reject. So we could write this rule down very easily in saying that we're going to reject whenever um, 
uh, square root n x bar minus mu naught over s is bigger than the appropriate normal quantile, and that's for the test that's purely greater than. Okay, and then we can just generalize these rules for the other cases. The easy one to consider is when the test is less than, of course, you know, we are just looking down there, right? It, it, here's our standardized statistic, our z statistic. It's x bar minus mu naught over s over square root n. And then if we're testing h naught mu equal to mu naught versus h a mu less than mu naught, we want to reject if, if, if this test statistic is small because we, we're going to, we want to reject if x bar is small enough. But we want to control the probability of rejecting under the null hypothesis so that we only do it with 5% probability. So we want to reject if it's less than this critical value right here, which would be z um, alpha rather than 1 minus alpha. But remember, z alpha is equal to negative z 1 minus alpha. So for example, in this case, it would be negative 1.645. Um, it's a little bit harder when you have the not equal to because we want to account for the possibility that we want to reject if the test statistic had been either too small or too large. So the way we go about doing that are the, the kind of comments. So here's our, our, our Z scale, our standardized scale. Here's our test statistic. And um, we, we, we want, we, the typical way to test not equal to is to put um, alpha over 2 in either tail, so that the probability that you reject under the null hypothesis includes the probability of rejecting too high or rejecting too low. So we could write that out just if the absolute value of our test statistic is bigger than the appropriate quantile. So this is z1 minus alpha over 2, and then um, this is z alpha over 2, but remember that's equal to negative z1 minus alpha over 2. So um, if we say that our, if our test statistic test statistic being larger, this again being our test statistic, larger than z1 minus alpha over 2, or test statistic being less than negative z1 minus alpha over 2. That's equivalent to saying absolute value of the test statistic is bigger than z1 minus alpha over 2. So the procedure would be calculate your test statistic. If it's negative, throw out the sign so that it's positive and compare it to the upper quantile of the normal distribution where you divided your alpha rate by 2. So that's a two-sided test. Two-sided tests are the norm, right? So even in cases where it's obvious of interest to do a one-sided test, most journals, regulatory agencies, everything require two-sided tests. I don't know why, but they do. It's a, well, I mean, I guess we do know why, right? It's more conservative, right? You know. Um, it's more conservative, right? Here's, here's z um, 1 minus alpha, and here's z 1 minus alpha over 2. It's further out into the tail. It's harder to reject. So it's a little bit more conservative to always just say do the two-sided test. So note, we've, we've fixed alpha to be low. So if we reject h naught, then there's one of two possibilities. Either our model is wrong, of course, which is always the case, or there's a there's a pretty low probability that we've made an error, um, right? It, it was it was it would be unlikely to get a test statistic as large or small as we obtained if we reject H naught under the null hypothesis and the sampling assumptions we've made, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we have not, however, fixed the probability of a type two error, uh, beta. Um, therefore. Um, because we don't know whether or not that's small, we tend to say fail to reject H0 rather than accepting H0, right? So the idea behind that is sort of along the lines of, imagine if you um, only collect two subjects, right? You have a very noisy statistic. Um, the standard, standard error for that average is quite high. So the chance that you reject, even if, even if you're under the alternative, is quite low. And so um, it, it would be unfair to say that you conclude the null hypothesis in that case. You have appropriately controlled the probability of making a type 1 error so that it's still low regardless of the sample size. But the type 2 error, 
right, um, you had no control over, and because you had a low sample size, or maybe in another instance where you have a lot of variation, it's not fair to say that the alternative isn't true because you haven't given the alternative a, a fair shake to really to, to, to be evaluated. If you rejected, you know, maybe that's some compelling evidence, but because you failed to reject um, and you haven't um, controlled the type 2 error rate, um, you know, it would be unfair to, 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 to say H not, HA is false. Instead, we say that we failed to reject H0 or there was insufficient evidence to reject H0 rather than saying we accept H0 um, because unless you, you know beta, which you rarely do, um, you, you, you haven't really given that, that alternative, um, you haven't ensured that making errors of those types are, are small. Okay, so another way to, to think about this is, is, is as follows, or at least another way to visualize this. Here's the distribution of our normalized test statistics. So this is a Z distribution, it's centered at zero, its standard deviation is one. Um, we choose our critical value, we choose our critical value, um, and let's just assume it's a one-sided greater than test. So we choose our critical value Z so that uh, alpha lies underneath there and 1 minus alpha lies in the opposite direction. Okay, now imagine if the alternative is true, right? So what would be the case is the, the it would still, let's say, um, let's say the only way we're in the alternative is that the mean is shifted to the right. And so this probability right here, right, that is beta. That's our type 2 error rate, right? That's the, so, so if the pink curve were true, in other words, the mean was shifted to the right, um, um, then, then, then zero, our, our standardized mean, so mu, uh, the true mu is to the right of mu naught, Okay. Um, then that there 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 is beta right there. Now you can see as if you were to move this pink curve right or left, you can make beta um, bigger or smaller. And and as you as you, you could if you move the distribution the the density far to the left, where it's practically overlapping with the null density, um, beta can get quite large. Um, and you know, if it as it heads in that direction, you can see that it would get quite small. The other thing that's worth noting, just because we have this picture up, you can move this that as you move the type one error rate around. Hopefully, you see that that as you move the, the as you move in that direction, your type one error rate gets this this guy. You collect more area um, there, but you get less area under the magenta um, alternative curve. So at any rate, the fact that we, we have almost no control over this pink curve and where it lands is, um, is why we tend to say fail to reject H0 um, rather than accepting H0. If we knew that beta was small, um, then the, on the order of what alpha is, then we would say we would accept H0. So let's see, some other points. The, the z-test requires um, the assumptions of the CLT and then for n to be large enough for it to apply um, or for the data to be exactly normal. Um, if n is small, then we're just replacing the, the, the z-test by the t-test. And I, we won't go through it because it's, you, you, are, you guys already know how to do it. Oh, and there's a little typo there. Um, the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it's false is a, is a concept called power. We'll have an entire lecture on that. So, um, and, and then power is used. So, so there is one way in which we have control over. So, um, so this uh, beta is equal. So beta, the type two error rate, is equal to one minus the power. So we do have. Um, so, so, so we do have uh, some ways to control beta. Um, for example, the, the, the most notable being the sample size, n. If we make n bigger, then we control beta better. Um, we make beta smaller. 
And so uh, one way to ensure that your beta is small is before you conduct the experiment, do a so-called sample size calculation to make, and to make um, beta uh, tolerably small so that you know that if you fail to reject the null hypothesis, you know that you have given the alternative its, its fair due. Um, so let's consider our example again, um, just to do a, I know I said I wasn't going to do a t-test example, but let's just do it anyway. Um, suppose that n was 16 rather than 100, then we would just compare our, um, our test statistic with now square root 16 rather than square root 100, um, and we would compare it to a t, the appropriate t-quantile, with 15 degrees of freedom. So now our test statistic is 0.8, while the critical value is 1.75, so we now fail to reject. So two-sided test, I think we, we've already done this a little bit. Um, um, so uh, in, in this case, we, we want to test larger than, but like I, uh, uh, like I said, um, the standard in journals, for example, is to test two-sided tests even if the, the, the less than hypothesis doesn't make a lot of con contextual sense in your, in your example. Um, so at any rate, in, in this case we're going to reject if the test statistic is too large or too small, so right under the null hypothesis, here's our Z or our T distribution, and we're going to put um, alpha over 2 probability in either tail, and we're going to compare our test statistic if it's either too large positive or too small negative, which is the same thing as saying its absolute value is bigger than the T cutoff value, and that by doing that, that adds alpha over 2 in that tail, alpha over 2 in that tail for a total of alpha. In our example, the critical value is 2.13, so we failed to reject, but we knew that because we failed to reject for the one-sided test. The two-sided test is just going to make it higher, harder. Let's go through a example using R. So um, here's this father-son data, and I want to test um, th on the difference between the father's, uh, the the son's height and the father's height, testing whether up to the variation seen in the data, um, are, are do um, um, sons tend to be a little bit taller than their fathers, for example. Okay, so the the, the t-statistic, um, there's a lot of um, subjects, but the t-statistic works out to be 11.79, um, uh, which is a pretty big t-statistic. Um, the degrees of freedom are so large that it doesn't matter whether you use a t or a z-test, it's going to give you a t-test anyway. P-value, we'll talk about the p-value later on. Um, this is doing a not equal to test. It's, uh, it gives a 95% confidence interval, and so in this case you would know um, you would know that you were going to reject. It doesn't. Uh, we'll show you how to read the p-value part of the output, but but also you just know that 11 is a huge t statistic, so you'd know that you would reject. Um, so consider. Um, testing not equal to, uh, there is this equivalence between hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. So if you take a, all the possible values of mu for which you fail to reject H0, which, which you know, uh, those, are, um, those are the set of values which there was insufficient evidence to reject. So at some level they're supported. Um, this, they're supported as reasonable values of mu in the sense that we can't find enough evidence in the data to throw them out. And so, at um, any rate, that seems like a nice uh, set of reasonable values of mu, and it turns out that that's identical to the confidence interval. So if you take a hypothesis test and you take the set of parameter values for which you fail to reject the null hypothesis, that forms a confidence interval. Conversely, if you perform a hypothesis test by taking a two-sided confidence interval and testing whether or not the hypothesized value is in the interval and rejecting if it's outside of the interval and failing to reject if it's inside the interval, then that is equivalent to the two-sided test. Okay? So, um, so as, a, as a very common example, if you do a T-confidence interval 
you know, you get negative five to, to, to positive six, right? Um, often you're, you're comparing whether zero is that in, in, in that interval. Say, for example, if you do a two group T test, right? And so if zero is that in, in, in that interval, you would um, fail to reject if the interval is entirely above zero, say it was five to six instead of negative five to six, then we would reject, okay? Um, so if you know the confidence interval, you know the result of the two side of the two sided hypothesis test. As as an example, in this case, the confidence interval is uh, 0.8 to 1.16, and so because this interval is entirely larger than zero, we know that we will reject. But we also know it because we know the p value and because we know the test statistic is big uh, on the scale of t quantiles, um, especially because we know that. Um, this t with this many degrees of freedom is a lot like a z test, and we know we know all the benchmark z values by heart. So also, you know, the, so but the confidence interval, the, the, there's a benefit to that because the confidence interval is you know informative on the units of the data, right? So we know if we report this confidence interval, we know that oh yeah, well the mean increase in height of suns seems to be about 0.8 of an inch. Um, uh, to 1.1 inches. I wanted to cover at least one hypothesis te testing scenario where it wasn't a binomial, I mean where it wasn't a normal, so I'm going to do the binomial. Um, so um, suppose, recall this problem we had before, a friend has eight children, seven of which are girls, none are twins, um, and we want to, under the hypothesis that children's genders are IID with a coin flip. Um, we want to just look at the possibility that this probability isn't 0.5, it's maybe a, a probability bigger than 0.5. So we want to test H not P equal 0.5 versus H A P greater than 0.5. So abstracting from the problem, the hypothesis of test we want to determine, we get X is binomial um, 8 P and we want to test H not P equal to 0.5 versus H A P bigger than 0.5. So the clear test statistic is the bigger that X is, the more evidence that that is going to be in favor of H A. So what we need is a critical value so that under H naught, the probability of rejecting is 5%. The probability of being larger than that is 5%. Well, we look at for the binomial, here's for, for the 0 to 8, of course, that probability is 1 of that rejection region. The probability of 1 to 8 is 0.99. 2 to 8 is 0.96 and so on. If we went 6 to 8, we the, if we said, okay, we're going to reject if x, our binomial, is 6 or larger, then our type 1 error rate would be 14%, uh, um, which is still too large. So 7 and 8, 7 and 8, the probability of getting uh, 7 or 8 girls out of 8 is uh, children under the assumptions we've made is around 4%. So if we did this as our rejection region, we would have a type 1 error rate of 0.0352%. Uh, so we could do this, um, we could do this test by saying, um, so, so we could conclude basically if you want a type 1 error rate of below 5% and you have a binomial with n um, equal to 8 and p equal to 0.5 under the null hypothesis where you're testing bigger than, if you were to do a rejection region of 7 or 8, you would have a type 1 error rate that, that can, that, that's um, acceptable, less than 5%. So let's, let's discuss this a little bit. So in this case, you would reject according to that test. So um, notice in this case, it's impossible to get an exact 5% level test because of the discreteness of the binomial. So the closest one is 7 to 8. It's also true that any alpha level lower than 0 0.0039 is not attainable um, because um, that's, the, it, it, that's what you get if you get all eight successes. Um, for larger sample sizes, we could do a normal approximation, but you already know this. Um, and how you, do, how you do a two-sided test exactly in this case isn't obvious, um, but here's what you can do. Um, so... Um, The, actually, I think probably I'll hold off on telling you how to do the two-sided test until, um, well, no, I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you one.
um, an, an example. Um, so, so we could create as our test statistic x minus x over n minus p naught, okay, absolute value. Um, so that test statistic um, has a probability, a discrete probability distribution, right? X can only take values 0 to 8. So this test statistic has, and, but it's a two-sided test statistic. We would want to reject if that test statistic was too large. So you could calculate um, a rejection region based on that test statistic that gives you 5% um, or lower probability of rejecting. So that's how you could do it. We'll give you a simpler rule after we cover p-values, which is to double the smaller of the two one-sided p-values. But given a, a way to do two-sided tests, it is interesting to note that you could find the collection of values of p naught for which we fail to reject, and that would give us an exact binomial confidence interval, um, not a large sample binomial confidence interval. And by the way, this is something that's known, and it's called the Klopper-Pearson interval, by the way. Um, so for these problems, you know, people never figure out the rejection region. They always just create a p-value. And we'll show you how to do that in the next lecture.